Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Wednesday, May 26th, 2021, and today I've got one of my favorite 19th century writers, Lysander Spooner, who was not only known as a leading anarchist thinker and writer of the time, but was also one of the top writers on the Constitution, a legal scholar, actually, which might be kind of an odd combo. But on this episode, I'm covering one of his most important abolitionist works called A Defense for Fugitive Slaves, written in 1850. I'm going to go through the top three or four, we'll say, of his seven arguments against the constitutionality of the hated and evil Federal Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Then I'm going to highlight his recommendations on how to deal with it. And dealing with it really wasn't focusing on getting the people in Washington, D.C. to somehow stop being slave catchers. It was relying on the people and the states to resist and nullify. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Our show homepage has everything you need to follow this program. It's 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty, all spelled out, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to to Liberty, and there you're going to find all the archives of the show. And on individual episodes like uh, today's, I will link to all kinds of things that I'm mentioning in the show so you can read and learn more in context on your own time. I even have a couple of other episodes from time to time so you can check out other things and learn additional stuff. We've got all the different platforms we're on. Of course, we live stream on the mainstream ones like YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and Twitter. But we're also on a bunch of the so-called alternative platforms. And we want to be as many places as possible. So if we're not someplace yet and you use that platform more regularly than where you find us, just let me know, team at 10thamendmentcenter.com or drop a comment down in the archive and I will see that at some point as well. But we're also on places like odyssey.com, library.tv, uh, tv.gab.com. We're on MeWe and Minds. We're on Brighteon and BitChute and BitTube and Hyper and sometimes we're on IGTV and Pinterest and all over the place. We basically want the content to be everywhere to reach as many people as possible. We also have the audio-only podcast edition and you can even find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month. Again, the show homepage is 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. I want to say a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. Uh, give people another moment or so to get notifications to join us for the live stream. There's Greg McCauley down in Tex Temple, Texas. Good to see you. Haji in Oakland County, Michigan. Melody Scame in MRGF78. Dixie Strong in Bama. Rachel Menard here, just so Michael could say my name. Done. All right. Have a good day, Rachel. <laughs> good to see you, Rachel. I appreciate all your support. Clay Kent, Stephen Galindo, D.L. Neal. Good to see you as well. Jim Black, Mike Takash or Takak, uh, that Liberty gal, Blue North Wind, and everyone else. I apologize if I missed anybody, but let's get right to it. I want to do a quick, and I know those of you who are regular viewers or listeners of this program or longtime readers of the 10th Amendment Center, this introductory information is going to be not new to you, but let's just set the stage. A quick overview of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which on last Friday's show, I included as one of the five worst laws in U.S. history, and I put laws in quotes, because really, an unconstitutional act is no law at all. An act that, an act of usurpation outside the bounds of the delegated powers in the Constitution is not constitutional. It is void. And we're going to get a quote on that a little bit later today, I think. But let's go to it. Here from Mike Meharry on September 18, 1850, President Millard Fillmore, felt Millard Fillmore signed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 into law. It set up a legal structure to facilitate the capture of runaway slaves and their return to their so-called owners. Evil on its face. Abolitionists dubbed it the Bloodhound Law. It significantly expanded the provisions of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793 and was extremely unpopular in the northern states. They all took action to undermine, to opt out, to use the anti-commandeering approach that we talk about today, and to aggressively nullify it uh, in every northern state. The law erased any semblance of due process for an accused runaway, Mike points out. A white man could basically drag a black man or woman into slavery on the power of his word. Accused runaways weren't even allowed to testify in their own defense, and that's one of the big things that Spooner talks about as well. 
that like if you can only have one side presenting the case and then just assume to be correct, this is just nowhere authorized in the Constitution. So even if you think that somehow the federal government would have some kind of power to do stuff about runaway slaves, which I mean, just because they're authorized to do something, even if you could make that case doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. They're not supposed to exercise every power they have. They don't have to. They should actually just reject that type of thing on a moral ground as well. Now, Spooner, for example, thought the the idea of slavery in itself was unconstitutional. It was a barefaced user patient right off the bat. But going further here, uh, Mike, a quick more from the summary. He says the law also empowered marshals to, quote, summon and call to their aid the bystander. So anybody in the area in order to capture and hold an accused fugitive slave. And Mike says, in effect, a federal marshal and their deputies could force anybody into serving as a slave catcher, even against their will. So it was against the law to actually not participate when you're called upon by the federal government to participate. It was trying to turn all the northern states, all the northern people really into slave catchers. Now, let's get into Spooner and hear from libertarianism.org. I think it's .org. Yeah, I will link to this in the show notes. This is an article. There's a whole series of articles on this from George H. Smith that really does great work on Spooner. And he starts it out like this. Lysander Spooner's The Unconstitutionality of Slavery was one of the most widely read, circulated and read books written by an abolitionist. It was published in two parts, 1845 and 1847. They were published as a single book in 47, 49, 53, 56, and 60. And the 1860 printing contains additional essays, including the one that I want to cover today, A Defense for Fugitive Slaves in 1850. This was Spooner, according to Smith, this was Spooner's devastating critique of the notorious Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 which prompted many anti-slavery activists to use violence, I would say to use nullification as well, to rescue runaway slaves from their captors. Going further in another article, here is um, uh, Smith again at libertarianism.org. He said, Spooner set out to show in the unconstitutionality of slavery that the Constitution of the United States, and this is in Spooner's word, not only does not recognize or sanction slavery as a legal institution, but on the contrary, it presumes all men to be free, that it positively denies the right of property in man, and that it of itself makes it impossible for slavery to have a legal existence in any of the United States. Now, I think uh, I'm not a huge fan of how he made the case here. I like the moral imperative that he does, and maybe I could go through those arguments in a future episode if you guys are really interested in it. But he's, he does his foundation through the Declaration of Independence, through the natural law, natural rights position, and he makes a lot of very interesting arguments to make the, make the position, take the position that it was unconstitutional in and of itself in the first place, and because it's unconstitutional, it's void and needs to be resisted. But then setting that aside, he actually writes this additional essay to try to help people in response to the Fugitive Slave Act. Like, look, you can wave that document saying or that book saying, oh, this is unconstitutional. You can't own somebody all you want. But that doesn't really change anything in practice on the ground if they don't agree with you. If the people in power don't agree with you, you have to do something about it. So he goes through the constitutionality in seven main parts on the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. I'm going to cover a few of those here. And then he gives advice on what people need to do. So here from Online Library of Liberty at libertyfund.org, this from the introduction. I'm not sure who wrote the introduction, but they have it here. Since, in Spooner's view, slavery was both unjust and unconstitutional, men and women held in slavery had the right to flee and other people had the right and the duty to help the runaway slaves escape to freedom. This meant violating the Fugitive Slave Acts and breaking the law, nullifying it. You're not really breaking the law if the law in of itself, and that's Spooner's take, if the law shouldn't have existed in the first place, it's void. All the founders told us this. An unconstitutional act, an act of usurpation is not, is not law. It is void, and it's up to the people to treat it that way as well. So uh, maybe there... Maybe a semantic issue here with Liberty Fund. This meant violating the Fugitive Slave Act and breaking the law, but these acts would be in the freedom-loving spirit of the Constitution. That's from the introduction to the book. Now, let's look at some of the arguments that Spooner makes. He makes seven arguments against the constitutionality of the Federal Act. First of all, 
This is actually his first one, even though it's listed as section two in his book, Denial of a Trial by Jury. And he puts it this way. Neither the act of 1793 nor that of 1850 allows the alleged slave a trial by jury. And he points out that really the only argument in support of this comes from Daniel Webster. I mean, in support of the fact that, well, too bad, they don't need this. Daniel Webster was just awful. He marched into, you know, he marched into Syracuse and pointed out like the Fugitive Slave Act will be enforced to the fullest extent, even right here in Syracuse, which was the Grand Depot of the Underground Railroad in New York. And also it was going to be the next anti-slavery convention. He was threatening the federal government was going to come in there in force. It didn't really play out that way, but we can cover that elsewhere. But Webster made a strong case. Well, he was an aggressive case. It was a bad constitutional argument that people don't get, uh, get a, if you're accused of being property, you are property. You don't really get uh, an action. It's not a suit. It's not at common law. There's nothing that authorizes or requires a trial by jury. So too bad. And what they're really talking about here is the Seventh Amendment. And Spooner cites the amendment as well. And it says in suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. And no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examine in any court of the U.S. than according to the rules of the common law. So that's that's his first position. They don't even have a chance of calling a jury of their peers, of the people in the community where the trial is taking case. He also talks about how these really are just sham courts and sham trials. And that's what comes up next. He's talking about the commissioners. Number two, he says the commissioners authorized by the Act of 1850 are not constitutional tribunals for the performance of of the duties assigned to them. So the case is when someone actually accused someone of being an escaped slave, they were saying, this is my property. I want to go catch them. The federal government has this law on the books that creates a special tribunal that isn't actually in the federal court system. And it's actually run by commissioners. Now, many of the people who were appointed as commissioners or took the job as commissioners, it was really kind of a commission based position. So it was actually kind of a financial incentive, which we'll get to in a moment as well. But they took these positions. They weren't part of the official court system. They were commissioners. So they were held outside and they were actually paid $10 every time that when they looked at the evidence or they looked at the affidavit presented by the so-called slave owner and they didn't listen to any defense from the alleged runaway that they were paid 10 bucks to send someone back to slavery and five bucks to send them to freedom. This is how government works. They find the absolute worst outcome and then they financially incentivize it. And then they probably have you add printing the money to make it more common. Then you've got that as well. And he points out that these commissioners in this type of case, really, they're acting as judges within the meaning of the term as used in the Constitution. And being judges, they necessarily come within that clause of the Constitution, which is Article 3, Section 1. It's He's basically making the case that if you're just paying them a fee based on how they perform, this is in and of itself violating the Constitution. Because Article 3, Section 1 says specifically... The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. So he's saying, like, look, you're just paying them a commission and you're giving them an increase in commission to send people in slavery. This is not if if they're trying a case, they have to be considered a judge. You can't just pretend that they're outside the system. And then you have to pay them according to this system. And there there's a reason for that. He says the object of this provision in of the Constitution in requiring that all judges and he put judges in quotes because we know that advocates of the Federal Fugitive Slave Act are saying, well, these aren't judges. These are commissioners and they're using technical legal terms in order to give the federal government more power that was never delegated to it in the Constitution. I'm not sure and I can't remember if uh, if I saw in there that there actually is no authorization. I, I'm sure he actually made that point as well. Well, there is no authorization to create new types of tribunals like a commissionership that is outside the federal court system. So there's no authorization to even do that. So he's saying, like, look, there's an object to this. They shall receive a fixed salary or a compensation at stated times instead of receiving their pay in the sh shape of fees in each such case. 
making its aggregate amount contingent upon the number of cases they may try was to secure their impartiality and integrity as between the parties whose causes should come before them. So if you're encouraging them to just take more cases and do more, this is kind of a side hustle job working as a commissioner. And Massachusetts, for example, in 1855, their Personal Liberty Act, which may have actually come out of this as well, some of the advice from this, they made any state judge, if they took on a job as a commissioner, they lost their job as a state judge for life. So they were ineligible to serve as that position. And this was a big deal because the last person ever captured as an, as an accused runaway slave, a guy named Anthony Burns, I believe it happened in 1856. And after that, and the, there was a lot of opposition to it. He was sent back into slavery in the South. It's a horrible story. But because of that Massachusetts personal liberty law, which included saying, well, we've got no one to serve as commissioners here. There was not a single person after that year from 56 to 60 that was ever recorded as being captured under the Fugitive Slave Act because of that resistance. So back to Spooner, he says, if a judge were to receive his compensation in the shape of fees for each case, he would have a pecuniary inducement to give a case to the plaintiff with re without regard to its merit. So someone who is having a hard time or needs to pay for an extra doctor or something you know, they're going to be swayed by the extra financial incentive. No, no matter how good a person is, they're sometimes going to be put in a position where they're going to say, can I make more money to do this? And if they aren't a really rock solid moral person and even a rock solid moral person might choose the lesser what they consider to be the lesser of two evils. And that is unconstitutional, according to Spooner. And it's unconstitutional, according to me as well. Going further, the next part is, uh, this is his fourth one, and this is considering ex parte evidence. The Act of 1850 is unconstitutional, Spooner writes, in that it authorizes cases to be decided wholly on ex parte testimony. What is that? It's really testimony that comes from just one party. And I've got up on the screen here that this is from uh, Cornell Law School. It says ex parte is Latin for from one party. So someone is submitting an affidavit. They're just saying, you know, under oath, this is my property. This person, I own this person and they've run away and that they can consider the entire case based on that alone. And here again from Cornell Law School, they say in civil procedure, ex parte is used to refer to motions for orders that can be granted without waiting for a response from the other side. It is a one-sided argument. Typically, they say a court will be hesitant to make an ex parte motion. This is because the Fifth Amendment and now the 14th, which was ratified after this whole uh, scenario that Spooner's talking about, guarantee a right to due process and ex parte motions due to their exclusion of one party risk violating the excluded party's right to due process. So there is no due process. That's how Mike Meharry summed it up right in the beginning. It just destroyed any semblance of due process because they're saying only one side is allowed to actually make the case on whether or not someone is owned. You don't have a trial by jury. You can't even come out in defense. And here from Spooner again, he says, the fourth section of the act makes it the duty, in quotes, the duty of, quote, court, judge, or commissioner, doesn't matter how they set it up, to deliver up an alleged fugitive, and again from the law, upon satisfactory proof being made by deposition or affidavit in writing. In other words, they're just putting paperwork under oath, penalty of perjury. They're saying, I'm signing this saying, okay, you can charge me with perjury, but I own this person. This person escaped on this day, and they're mine, and they should come back to me. And the the commissioner or judge or court can actually deliver up the alleged fugitive to the so-called owner based on that alone. And with proof also by affidavit of the testimony of the identity of the person. So the person doesn't get to respond. It's all against them. It thus allows, Spooner writes, the whole proof to be made by affidavit alone, which is wholly an ex-party affair. And again, he says the 10th section of the act is of the same character as the fourth, except that it is worse. 
It just keeps getting worse as you go through it. He says it not merely just permits, but requires that this ex-party evidence, when a transcript thereof is exhibited in the state where the alleged fugitive is arrested, and this is from the law itself, shall be held and taken to be full and conclusive evidence of the fact of escape and that the service of labor of the person escaping is due to the party of the record mentioned. Okay, a lot of words there. It's basically saying if someone signs an affidavit that says and under oath of perjury, right, under oath, under penalty of perjury, if they sign this and say, this is my person, the court has to actually uh, take that as to be full and conclusive evidence of the person was uh, an escaped runaway, an escaped slave. That's it. I mean, so it absolutely requires that soon as they produce that type of evidence, they write something down, it's done. There is no defense against it at all. And Spooner puts it this way. There's not a syllable in the whole act that suggests, implies, or requires that the individual whose liberty is an issue shall be allowed the right to confront or cross-examine a single opposing witness or even the right to offer a syllable of rebutting testimony in his defense. So the person is locked out from defending themselves almost completely. It is a one-sided affair. This is a total pro-slavery federal act, one of the worst in history. And here, Spooner makes a Tenth Amendment argument. I mean, we think of him as an anarchist who says the Constitution was a failure, but he certainly made a lot of strong constitutional arguments throughout his career in the 1840s, 1850s, and the like. And even when he was a lawyer in the 1830s, he was actually a nullifier right when he started. What he, his first main job was a lawyer up in Massachusetts. He was trained by some of the top legal minds of the time, and he didn't go to college. And in Massachusetts, this is a quick side note, in Massachusetts law at the time, if you went to college, then you had to train under a trained lawyer for three years. If you didn't go to college, you had to train for five years. And Spooner, uh, you know, even on the recommendation of some of the people who were training him, they basically said, you you know your stuff. Go ahead and start practice. So he started, he didn't go to college, and he started, he opened his practice after three years, even though they said you had to go five years. And he made the case, he's like, this is discrimination against people who study and learn this stuff but can't afford to go to school. Of course, a lot of government regulations are really just protecting the people who have the means to do something and harming those who do not. Anyway, so here's Spooner's Tenth Amendment argument. He says, among all the enumerated powers granted to Congress, there is no one that includes or bears any the remotest resemblance to a power to prescribe what evidence shall and what shall not be admitted by the courts in the trial of a case. And so they're saying you can't allow the evidence from this person in defense of being an alleged slave. That's it. And there's nothing in the Constitution that authorized this. If we understand that the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states, respectively, or to the people, we understand that the federal government's powers are limited to those things that were delegated to it in the text of the Constitution itself. He says there is none that bears any resemblance to a power to authorize or require the courts to decide cases on ex parte testimony alone. If Congress can authorize courts to decide cases on hearing the testimony of one side only, then they clearly have the same right to authorize them to decide them without hearing any evidence at all. So that's his 10th Amendment argument. I mean, he doesn't cite the 10th and he didn't even actually specifically cite the 7th as well earlier, but he talked about the amendment and he's talking about trial by jury. Everyone understands what that's all about. And then the next one that I want to talk about here is habeas corpus. He says the provisions of the Act of 1850, oh, this is again talking about evidence, requiring the exclusion of certain evidence are unconstitutional. And he says there are two provisions in the Act which specially require the exclusion of testimony. And this is where we're going to get briefly into the specifics of how someone wasn't authorized to defend themselves at all, present evidence contrary to what the so-called slave owner is presenting. We're not even talking about the natural right of self-ownership here. The idea, and in fact, Spooner makes that case in his Unconstitutionality of Slavery, written in the 1840s, which this was attached to in the 1860 publication. But just beyond that philosophical argument, the notion that someone else can own another person, that in and of itself can't exist in any moral or just society anyways. 
He says there are two provisions in the Act of 1850 which specially require the exclusion of te testimony on part of the defendant. The first is the one Section 10 already commented on, which requires that certain ex parte testimony taken by the claimant, quote, shall be held and taken to be full and conclusive evidence on the two points that it relates. That is, who is this person and is this person your property that escaped? The other provision, he said, is in the fourth section, and it has these words. In no trial or hearing under this act shall the testimony of such alleged fugitive be admitted. It literally specifically says in a federal act, and I've had people tell me that nullification of the Fugitive Slave Act was illegal because the Fugitive Slave Act was somehow constitutional because slavery was in the Constitution and therefore the federal government was authorized to, uh, under the Necessary and Proper Clause, make provisions for capturing runaway slaves, for enforcing slavery in the Constitution. Even if you think that that is all okay, this absolutely is nowhere authorized to the federal government in the Constitution. Specifically, quote from the act, in no trial or hearing under this act shall the testimony of such alleged fugitive be admitted. They're basically saying it's a one-sided case. Present your position and you cannot have any testimony whatsoever in response. And then the last piece that I want to cover here on uh, the unconstitutionality of the act is the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. He says the sixth section of the act provides that, quote, the certificates in this and the first section shall be conclusive of the right of the person or persons in whose favor granted to remove such fugitive to the state or territory and shall prevent all molestation of such person or persons by any process issued by any court, judge, magistrate, or other person whomsoever. Basically, once this commissioner says, this is it, you're, I'm getting my 10 bucks, you're going back to slavery, there is no habeas corpus whatsoever. There is no last gasp, no Hail Mary, nothing. It cannot be molested by any process any court, any judge, any magistrate whatsoever. It is final. And of course, uh, there is no suspension of habeas corpus as, unless specific as spelled out in the Constitution. It doesn't include something about escaping slavery. So I want to go forward to the next section, the right of resistance. I'm only going to cover this briefly by the individuals and then by the states. The right of the resistance and the right to have the legality of that resistance judged of by a jury. I did an episode, one of my favorites, on the right of the trial by jury, trial by country rather than trial by government. I focused heavily on works by Joe Wolverton, my buddy, who's uh, been writing with us for many, many years. And then, of course, on Spooner's great work on the trial by jury as well. I should have had a link to that, but I do not have it handy. But here's how he puts it. He says, if it has been shown that the acts of 1793 and 1850 are unconstitutional, it follows that they can confer no authority upon the judges and marshals appointed to execute them. And those officers are consequently in law mere ruffians and kidnappers who may be lawfully resisted by anybody and everybody like any other ruffians and kidnappers who assail a person without any legal right. This is the mentality that so many people do not have today. The vast majority of the people today, when their rights are violated, even if they think that government is doing something wrong, most people think, well, I got to take it to court or hopefully someone else will take it to court or I got to vote the bums out in the hopes that the next dude is going to come in or the next lady is going to come in and just give back all this power that attacks my rights. But this almost never happens. And the size and scope of government, when you rely on government this is really what they're doing. People are basically relying on the federal government to limit its own power, either through elections with new people in the federal government, through courts, hoping that the federal courts are going to say federal government, which they're part of, are going to limit federal power. We shouldn't be surprised when that government continues to grow when the vast majority of people have that approach. No matter how bad it gets, it'll keep growing and growing and growing until people take this type of approach. It doesn't have to be this exact one, but Spooner has, has the right idea here. When government does stuff that's outside the Constitution, you have to treat and think of the people as the bad guys. They are not your friends. No one in Washington, D.C. is a friend to liberty. I don't even care, even the least bad, because they're participating in the system.
that is the largest government in the history of the world. Anyway, so that's a, kind of a side note. And he's pointing out that these people who are capturing people and sending them into bondage are ruffians and kidnappers. And of course, he talked about uh, taxation in another essay, another uh, paper that he wrote. It's basically the government being a highway robber. But the highway robber, he pointed out, well, once they rob you, they let you go. But the federal government keeps stalking you and keeps coming for more and more and more. And here we go. To say that an unconstitutional law must be obeyed until it is repealed, said Spooner, is saying that an unconstitutional law is just as obligatory as a constitutional one, for the latter is binding only until it is repealed. So this notion that, well, they passed it, you just have to wait for the process, and then they decide, and then the courts will strike it down, let's say that takes two years. Let's say it takes... In the case of the Gonzalez versus Rage case, which didn't get struck down, the court case started in 2002, and then it went up all the way to the Supreme Court in 2005, and this was relatively high profile, and that's a three-year process. Sometimes they get fast-tracked, sometimes it's six years, sometimes they never get heard, sometimes the Supreme say, no, nah, we're going to leave it to the other courts. And the odds of actually having something overturned by the Supreme Court are so low, especially when they take anywhere from 10 to 20,000. Uh, they have 10 to 20,000 requests per year. They take maybe 100 cases a year and maybe they overturn two or three things. The odds of you having the financial means and even winning the lottery of getting to the Supreme Court and then hoping that they do the right thing is almost impossible. So what you're saying is, even if, and this is what Spooner is saying, even if the federal government determines that the federal government did something that was a violation of the Constitution for the United States, restricting the federal government, even if you get to that point, and they take, let's say, four years to do that, what people who say you have to wait for repeal before doing anything or overturning it in the courts are saying that an unconstitutional act has to be fully enforced until the people enforcing it decide that they're no longer going to enforce it. And this is not what the Constitution says. This is not what any of the founders said. They all said an unconstitutional act, an act of usurpation is void. And I'll get to some quotes from that in just a moment. He says, there would be no difference at all between a constitutional and an unconstitutional law in respect to their binding force. And that would be equivalent to abolishing the Constitution and giving to the government unlimited power. This sounds like uh, Jefferson in the Kentucky Resolutions of 1798, if you've read that. He says, the right of the people, therefore, to resist an unconstitutional law is absolute and unqualified from the moment the law is enacted. Right at one moment one. And he goes a little further here, and he says, this right of the people to resist usurpation. And for those of you who follow my work on this, I often quote the founders using these terms. The right of the people to resist the right of uh, the dealing with usurpation. The founders considered acts outside the Constitution to be an act of usurpation. The people of the several states are in the American system were meant to hold sovereignty, which is final authority, not the government telling the people the extent of the government's powers. And so when government usurps powers, the people are supposed to resist. He says, this right of the people, therefore, to resist usurpation on the part of the government is strictly a constitutional right. I would make the case that it's a natural right. It's not something that comes from the Constitution. I mean, it is from the structure of the Constitution, of course, because it is a structure that clarifies that the people of the states are at the top and they're delegating to an agent, the federal government, some powers. They, of course, can take that power back when they want, and they are the final authority on what's constitutional or not. He says, the exercise of the right is neither rebellion against the Constitution nor revolution. It is a maintenance of the Constitution itself by keeping the government within the Constitution. This is the tool to keep them limited. He says, it is also a defense of the natural rights of the people against robbers and trespassers who attempt to set up their own personal authority and power in opposition to those of the Constitution and people which they were appointed to administer. And here, one of these great quotes that I've cited many times, James Iredell, he was the uh, third uh, justice on the Supreme Court, associate justice. He was appointed by President Washington. He was a leading advocate for the Constitution in North Carolina. And here's how he put it. The only resource against usurpation, 
is the inherent right of the people to prevent its exercise. He also said in that same speech, or maybe it was another part uh, of this later in the day, this is in the North Carolina ratifying convention in 1788. He says, when the government usurps power, the people will resist. So he's using the same language that Spooner did, or Spooner maybe was using the language of Iredell. I don't know. Uh, but certainly it was the same thought, the same mental approach as well. And of course, I covered this in some detail in many episodes. Here's one that I wanted to point you guys to, which I will link to in the show notes, how to deal with unconstitutional acts, advice from the founders. This is from June of 2020. And just a quick summary I'll read. Most people think that the way to deal with the feds is march on the Capitol, vote the bums out, or sue in federal court. But most people are wrong. And I highlight things like Iredell's speech and many other founders and old revolutionaries talking about resisting usurpation, not waiting for the government to stop it on its own volition, which never uh, seems to be the case. Anyways, let's go to the next part here. Spooner says there are only two chances of security. He's pointing out that people who help out fugitives escape, people who help with the Underground Railroad, uh, states and localities that nullify, they're going to get charged with federal criminal charges. And he says there's only two chances of securities, uh, security against this. And this is part of his strategy. We've got to deal with this. We have to recognize that Daniel Webster and so many others want to fully enforce this Fugitive Slave Act. Fillmore was talking about in 1851, I believe, talking about using the military against Vermont for passing their habeas corpus law, their Personal Liberty Act uh, early on, which they strengthened even after that. So after they were threatened, this was published in the Memphis Daily Eagle, I think, in December of 1851. The administration was actually thinking about forcing the states to enforce the Federal Fugitive Slave Act, but they met so much resistance that that became probably politically unpopular. So Spooner's pointing out that they're trying to enforce this. Well, what can happen? Well, they can only be uh, they can be inflicted only upon indictment and conviction. So what's the defense against that? He says there's a probability that a grand jury will not indict for it is not their duty to do so if they think the law that has been resisted is unconstitutional. A grand jury have the same right to judge of the law as a traverse jury. So uh, it should get to the point he's saying the grand jury should not even indict when something is brought to them and someone is helping escape people escape slavery. The grand jury should just refuse to indict. And if you can't do that, then it doesn't even go to court. But if the grand jury does indict and it does go to court and if there is an indictment, he says the jury who try that indictment are judges of the law as well as the fact we're talking about jury nullification. If they think the law unconstitutional, unconstitutional, or even have any reasonable doubt of its of its constitutionality, they are bound to hold the defendants justified in resisting its execution. Now, again, Spooner is an anarchist. He won't take part in any political process, really. He's not for voting or parties or any of this stuff. He thinks the Constitution is a failure, but he still is able to actually, through his legal training, read it and understand what it's supposed to be. And he's also making a case in seven points to actually provide a reasonable doubt to juries who may have read this. This was a very widely read tract to juries that they may think, oh, wow, this is a I have a reasonable doubt of the constitutionality of this act. I should not convict this person. So he's advocating, he's providing the tools, the legal tools, and then saying, here's what you do with it. If someone is going to trial for this, for helping escaped runaways, uh, or escaped runaways, I guess that's redundant, then here's your, here's your process. Going forward, he says, an act of usurpation, this is, oh, this is the same thing that Theophilus Parsons, somebody that I cite many times, Theophilus Parsons in the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention said exactly the same thing. An act of usurpation is not obligatory. It is not law. And anyone may be justified in his resistance. Let him be considered as a criminal by the general government. Yet only his fellow citizens can convict him. This is back in 1788. This is one of the many, many founders and old revolutionaries who said, look, act of usurpation is not law. You have to resist it. And now he's also adding the jury nullification part, which is the exact same thing that Spooner was adding. They are his jury, said Parsons. And if they pronounce him innocent, not all the powers of Congress can hurt him. And innocent, they certainly will pronounce him if the supposed law he resisted was an act of 
of usurpation. And then just one final piece from Spooner. I know this is running long today. He says, if the laws of 1793 and 1850 are unconstitutional, this is his advice for the states, they are no laws in the view of the Constitution. Consequently, they confer no authority on anyone, and the U.S. judges, commissioners, and marshals who may assist in sending men into slavery in performance of them are liable to be punished under state law. So he's encouraging states to pass laws charging federal government officials with kidnapping for, for participating in what really is kidnapping. He says they are liable to be punished under the state laws as kidnappers, the same as they would have been if Congress had passed no act on the subject. And we know, uh, and this is back to Mike Meharry's article, for example, I've got a couple of examples. In 1858, Vermont passed an act to secure freedom to all persons within the state. That's the name of the act. It declared that any slave reaching the state was deemed to be free automatically and that anyone attempting to hold such would be subject to criminal kidnapping charges with a possible sentence of up to 15 years in prison. So Vermont, I'm not sure if they specifically got that law, the idea from Spooner, but we see how it played out. And then also... Uh, Ohio took another uh, approach like this in 1857. It passed an act to prevent kidnapping. They specifically addressed federal fugitive slave catchers as kidnappers, just like Spooner wrote in 1850 and was more widely reproduced in 1860. Forcibly, this is from the Ohio law in 1857, forcibly or fraudulently carrying off a free black person or mulatto would get you three to eight years of hard labor. Anyone trying to take an escaped slave out of Ohio was subject to the same charges if they failed to go to the proper court and prove ownership. And we know under the Oberlin Wellington rescue, which I've covered elsewhere on uh, this channel, this actually kind of happened. The feds actually arrested a bunch of people. They arrested a fed and they made a deal. I mean, there wasn't a lot of arresting feds, but it was the threat of having this type of conflict and having all these court actions that really helped slow things down. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope it was enjoyable to watch. I hope you learned something. I will link to all this stuff that I'm talking about in the show notes over at 10th Amendment Center com slash path to liberty. Uh, I publish these about a half hour to an hour after the live show is done broadcasting. Of course, if you support the show, you want to help us spread the word. Uh, a review over at Apple Podcast or any other podcast platform helps out a ton. Uh, smashing the like, leaving comments, sharing links. All that stuff triggers the algorithm of the platform, primarily the mainstream ones, and tells them to show the program to more people. So thank you so much for that. Of course, if you want to put your financial faith behind our work, it starts out as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Over on Facebook, David McNamee. I'm going to see if I can uh, answer a couple of questions. What document or book is this from? Uh, so I will link. There's a few things. So, for example, I cited some overview of the Fugitive Slave Act from an article by Mike Meharry and then the resistance to it in Ohio, Vermont and elsewhere. But we're talking about Lysander Spooner's A Defense for Fugitive Slave, A Defense for Fugitive Slaves of 1850, which was its own paper published in 1850 in response to the Fugitive Slave Act of that year and, of course, the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. But then it was also published as an addendum or an additional chapter uh, for the 1860 printing of his book, The Unconstitutionality of Slavery, which you can find all for free at thelibertyfund.org. I will link to all that in the show notes. Murray Ray says, resisting in Michigan. That's awesome. Great show. I really appreciate it. Melody Scamus says, thank you. Stay well and stay safe. Much love to all. Back to you as well. Rachel Menard, I wish you all love for liberty. We have to have that love of liberty in order to actually advance it. Samuel Adams told us that in 1771, I believe. You know, all might be free, he said, if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. So it's a one-two punch. We can't just educate on why liberty is better. We actually have to understand how to defend it in practice, not just in theory. So not only do we have to understand that our rights are natural, they come from our creator, they come from our earth, our God, however, whatever is right, the right terminology for you, they are natural rights. They are not gifts from government. When it comes with a government permission slip, it's a privilege that can be revoked. And when government can define the extent of your rights, it's not a right. It's not acting like a right, even though you still have it. So... We not only have to understand liberty, our freedom, our rights, we have to know how to defend them. And part of it is understanding how people in the past successfully used the tools at our disposal 
to defend liberty. And we saw this happen by through the Northern response to the Fugitive Slave Act with a lot of influence by the great Lysander Spooner. Anyways, I will look through uh, more of the comments a little bit later today. Of course, please leave them in the archive, which triggers that algorithm. Consider a membership at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. And thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoyed the show and I'll see you next time here on the path to liberty.